Hi everybody, this is Town Peterson. I believe we're in week 22 of the course. Congratulations if you've stuck with us this far. Um, this week we're starting into talking about model evaluation. And so hopefully you've already seen a video uh, recorded by Rob Anderson giving kind of a broad overview of model evaluation for niche modeling. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about specifics uh, in this talk. Uh, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk with you about approaches to model evaluation that are prediction based. So essentially we're asking how well can our model anticipate geographic distributions of the species that we're modeling. So let's jump into this. So talking, thinking about model evaluation, uh, we've got a lot to think about. Um, and I'm not gonna cover several of the key points in this talk because I'm trying to give you important basics, but just basics. So forgive me if I've left out um, a key topic that's near and dear to your heart. But let's talk about some generalities. First of all, the data that you use to calibrate your model and the data that you use to evaluate your data, your model, they really need to be independent. And that's not, ideally it's not just subsets of the same data set. Although sometimes you have to do that. Um, because subsets of the same data set will share the same biases. You know, maybe no mountain peaks were surveyed or no forest was surveyed. And so you can have shared biases uh, getting into your data and essentially confirming the model as good only because the calibration data and the evaluation data share the same biases. So again, you want to strive for independence and that could involve different techniques for gathering the data that could involve different regions spatially, but something. Second, um, we really want to establish whether the prediction is better than random expectations. So this is a significance test. We want to compare to some null model of zero predictive ability and make sure that we're doing better than that expectation. Third is you should evaluate model performance separately, which is to say one thing is the significance test and a very different thing is the performance test where you would make sure that your model is predicting well enough that it meets the needs of your study. And finally, only after a model has been tested and the test has been successful, should you be interpreting or exploring the model. Okay, so right away we come to this question of whether we want a threshold dependent test or not, or a threshold independent test. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to each one. If we look at thresholded uh, tests, those are very simple. And you'll see I can show you how to, how to do a threshold dependent test in a couple of slides. The interpretation is very clear and the computation is very easy. A, on the con side, on the negative side of thresholded tests, there are assumptions that are required in the thresholding step and these tests may be less well accepted by the broader community. Threshold independent tests, well, they have the advantage of avoiding the need for those thresholding steps and the assumptions, and also that these are tests that have been very well accepted by the broader community. On the negative side, their interpretation is not quite as clear. There are problems that are well known and well documented with the most frequently used uh, threshold independent tests. 
and also the computation can be a little bit more complicated. Well, let's jump into this. Let's talk about a threshold dependent test. So we will have set a threshold and that threshold basically creates a binary world. So across the region that is your testing region, which I think should be your M region or some other region that, that has been sampled and that the species has access to, um, we have values of either yes or no in a raster that covers that entire region. And so the proportional area predicted present is essentially what we expect as far as the, the predictive success if our map has zero predictive ability. So imagine just throwing some paint at a white sheet of paper and using that as your prediction. It shouldn't have any predictive ability. And so just, you know, if that paint covers a quarter of the area of your map, then one quarter of points will fall within the paint area um, under random expectations. And then we use a binomial test, a cumulative binomial test to assess whether the observed number of successes is greater than what we expect by chance alone. Now this is simple. Which of these two uh, archers is a better archer? obviously the one on the lower right and not the one on the upper left. And what it comes down to is, why do we say that? Well, it's because the archer on the lower right got more arrows into a smaller area. And that's exactly what we're gonna do with the binomial test. So if our predicted suitable area covers, for example, 15% of the testing area, then 15% of the evaluation points are expected to fall in that predicted area by chance. And so we're going to use that proportion, 0.15, as P, the proportion of area predicted as suitable. We have our test data and the number of points in that test data set is N and the number falling in the area predicted suitable is S. And so I put in the, even the little phrase from, uh, from Excel where you can do this test in a second, but the cumulative binomial probability distribution calculates the probability of obtaining S successes out of N trials in a situation in which P proportion of the testing area is predicted as suitable. If that probability is below 0.05, then we interpret the situation as indicating that the model's predictions are significantly better than random. And so in this example, you know, maybe the red square covers 15% of the blue square, and we have one, two, three, eight, number eight evaluation points and seven of those were successfully predicted by our model. Okay, and you can plug in 0.15, seven and eight and get an answer in Excel or in any number of programs very quickly. So that's a, that's a threshold dependent approach. And I guess we'll have to come back to the question of how to threshold your data optimally. I think we're gonna to have to add that to the, the uh, course content. Um, but that's a threshold dependent approach. Now let's talk about threshold independent approaches. And so this is essentially looking across some spectrum of possible thresholds and finding a test that applies across all of those thresholds. So for example, here is the most common uh, threshold independent approach. Uh, and essentially what we're seeing is predictions that go from predicting essentially none of the study area to essentially all of the study area. 
And so you can see those predictions are made at all of the values along that spectrum. And then we ask essentially for each of those possible thresholds, what is our omission rate? Okay, I'm, I'm rephrasing because I think it makes more sense this way. Um, but this is, you've probably heard about the rock test, receiver operating characteristic. And essentially what you do is you measure the area under this curve. So if this is scaled from zero to one and zero to one on the axes, then the area of this whole square is one. And we can basically ask for any observed curve, we can ask what is the area under that curve? And the area under that curve should be basically as close to one as possible because one basically has zero omission rate, which is sensitivity of one, in a very high specificity, such that one minus specificity is zero. And so that would be a curve that's shaped like this, which would have an area under the curve very close to one. Now, this, uh, this approach became very popular. I'll show you why in a moment, but it's also seen a lot of criticism. Uh, here's a paper by Jorge Lobo, um, Alberto Jimenez, and Raimundo Real, um, and a paper published in almost the same time, just a little bit later, by me and Mona Papej and, and Jorge Soberon. And essentially, each one of these papers points out major conceptual problems with this approach. Um, and essentially, what I want you to focus on is that the rock approach depends on a model correctly predicting presence information. At the same time, it correctly predicts absence information. But I want you to remember we've talked a number of times about we believe the presence information way more than we believe the absence information. And that, that difference is going to be at the root of a lot of these problems that are pointed out with, with rock tests. Um, just to give you a little bit of thinking about this, I want to remind you that this line here is how well a random predictor would do. And so a random model that predicts 0% of the study area as suitable will omit, omit everything and will therefore have a uh, sensitivity of zero. And a random model that predicts the whole study area as suitable will obviously have zero emission error. A random model that predicts half of the study area as suitable, well, half of the points will fall in that area by chance. And so really what we're doing is we're comparing the elevation of our observed curve over the null curve, and we're comparing, we're integrating that over all possible thresholds. So this curve might have an AUC, an area under the curve of 0.8, and the null is always going to have, uh, in traditional rock, it'll always have a, um, an area of 0.5 because it's half of the square. And then just as a way of thinking, and which we'll use later, is we can take a ratio of the, the observed to the null. And you can see that better than null is going to have a ratio of greater than 1 worse than no expectations will be less than one, and the highest possible will be a value of two. Now, here's why this method became so popular. Uh, it essentially hitchhiked along with a very popular paper. We've talked about this before. Remember the good, bad, the bad, and the ugly? Here's that graphic. Um, but essentially, this paper 
uh, which Jane Ela led and published in 2006. This paper presented two threshold independent approaches, rock AUC and this correlation based method, which really hasn't been used since then. But this, this paper, Elif et al. has been published, has been cited thousands of times and it's taken as very authoritative. And so my view at least is that, that the rock AUC method kind of um, hitched a ride and, and got very popular because of this paper. Uh, now there are a bunch of versions of this. Um, you can have a very probabilistic description. A value of 0.8 for AUC means that there's an 80% probability that a random selection from the presence records will have a model score greater than a random selection from the absence records. Well, a lot of the rock applications that you will see are much simpler than this. Um, there's a somewhere out there in the internet. There's a there's a um, a scale of you know, 0.6 or better is good, and 0.7 or better is really good, and 0.8 or better is really really good, and 0.9 or better is incredibly good. Um, but really, what this depends on is comparing against the null. And yeah, 0 0.9 is well above the null, but you can get spuriously large AUCs, uh, if, especially if you have small sample sizes. And so most uh, mature approaches to these data would say, let's, let's randomize and, and subset, and essentially bootstrap the input occurrence data that are being used to test, and let's develop a null distribution well, let's develop a distribution of observed values and compare the null against that, that uh, observed distribution and ask whether um, our observed values are significantly higher than the null. Um, again, there's quite a variety of, of, of applications and, and iterations of, of the rock test. But I really want to point you towards some of the problems that were pointed out. Um, so let's look at this Lobo paper. It points out, uh, first of all, that it's ignoring the actual predicted probability values. It's just a ranking of suitabilities. It speaks to regions of this, this two-dimensional space that are not very relevant. Here's the one I mentioned earlier. It weights omission and commission errors equally. It doesn't include any information about the spatial distribution of model errors. And the extent of the study area determines the outcome. So I'm just going to underline two of these for you. Here's that same diagram. But notice that participating in determining the area under the curve are these models, are these model predictions. And those are predictions that when challenged with independent evaluation data, they failed to predict more than half of those data. So those are not predictions that are particularly relevant because they don't have very good predictive ability. That's one of these failings. Another one is we can imagine the same prediction, but against different backgrounds. And so if our background is really big, then our curve shifts to the left and our area under the curve becomes quite a bit higher. Well, this comes back, this, this comes back to the Barve et al result where our area, our, our area for calibrating models, and guess what, also for evaluating models, needs to be set based on biological criteria, not based on whim or on, I don't know, political boundaries. 
But this really, at this point in the development of these methods, this really introduced an arbitrary element. Barve et al. would say, test your models over M, and that is indeed a biological assumption. But Lobo et al. pointed out correctly that the extent of our testing area determines the area under the curve. Okay, so just to point out, point this out a little bit more concretely, remember our full rock curve is assuming that we have values all along this curve. Well, years ago, um, Mona Papage and I and, and uh, a couple others published a paper comparing Maxent with desktop GARP. And all I want you to notice, I'm not arguing that one is better or the other is better, but notice that Maxent gives values all the way along this curve, whereas desktop GARP only this, this part up here. Now the area under the Maxent curve is quite a bit higher than the area under the GARP curve. And so Maxent looks quite a bit better. But you can see right away that this is essentially a point where right about here, GARP stops giving an opinion. And so it's artifactually got a lower area under the curve. Okay, so the modification, we call this partial rock analysis, is that the user defines some value E, which is how much omission error the user is willing to tolerate. Remember, this axis goes from zero omission error to full omission error. And so we come down from zero omission error to this level by E units. And that essentially tells us where to cut off these curves. And then we develop AUC ratios, remember the 1.6 that I showed you for here, but we can develop those AUC ratios based on the, the ratio of this area to, the, to this area. And we can then ask whether uh, that ratio is greater than 1.0. And all I, want, all I want to show you from the results of that study is that, pay attention to this mean line, um, when we did E equals 100%, we got, we looked at three different um, methods. We got an area under the curve of 1.46 for this, this algorithm MINDIST, and 1.488 for MAXENT, and a much lower 1.27 for GARP. But when we looked at more restricted sections of that rock space, which is to say we only care about models that have an omission error of 5% or less, notice that that mean came way down for MINDIST, and it was pretty much the same for GARP and MAXENT. And so all I'm saying is the results, when you look at the full rock curve, can be very different from the results of a partial rock analysis. And remembering that these, low, these higher omission um, parts of the full rock curve, they may not be very relevant. And so I just throw out the partial rock test as a way of avoiding some of these problems. Um, and so I'll, I'll put these papers up so that you can look at them. So, oh, and, and one last point is that partial rock is implemented within, um, within KUENM and within niche toolbox. And so it's, it's computationally a little more complicated because you're gonna bootstrap your input occurrence data and compare the lots of replicate partial rock curves with the null line uh, or with the null area by means of the AUC ratio. Uh, 
but it's quite doable now in in R or even in a shiny version of R. Uh, so you've you've got uh, tools available to you for doing these tests. Okay, last point is the difference between significance and performance. Again, predictions that are significantly better than random, that's really crucial. If your model is not predicting significantly better than random, don't interpret it, please. But you can have a model prediction that's better than random that still may not be good enough, may not be performing well enough for what you need for your model. Why are you doing this model? It may be your 1% better than random. It's significant, but it may not be very good for your purposes. So we need also to come up with performance measures like omission rate, correct classification rate, things like that. And these all or most are, are, uh, are derived from what's called the confusion matrix which is, you know, we have real information about these are presences and these are absences, and we have our prediction of presence versus absence. And so the perfect model would have A and D big and B and C zero. But just bear in mind that these are different kinds of model failures. This is predicting as unsuitable a place that is suitable. And this is predicting as suitable a place that in reality is unsuitable. So we have a bunch of performance measures, and some of them focus more on omission rates, some of them focus more on commission rates, some of them focus on overall predictive power, et cetera, et cetera. You need to figure out for your model what's the appropriate performance measure. For example, if you are looking to reintroduce a species and it's a really rare species, then maybe you don't have many individuals of that species to reintroduce. So you don't care about all of the sites that could possibly be suitable. What you care about is picking a site that definitely is suitable. So you don't want any commission error. But if you're looking for a species that maybe has gone extinct and you just want to pick out where any remaining population might be, then you might want to look at all possible sites. And commission error is OK. You just don't want to leave anything out. So pick your performance measure to match the needs of your study. OK. So last points, just to reiterate, um, calibration data and evaluation data need to be independent. You need to first test significance and then test performance. And only once the model has passed those tests should you ever ex interpret it or explore it. I hope that was useful, everybody. Um, Model evaluation is not easy, and you'd be surprised how many published papers there are out there that don't even evaluate their models or that evaluate their models using the same data that they use to calibrate their models. I hope you won't make those mistakes, um, but I, and I hope that this has helped a bit. I'm going to put up some of these papers for you. I'm also going to put up a review paper by Fielding and Bell. It's old, but it's great, so please read that. So with that, I will sign off and say goodbye to you. Um, hope you're enjoying the course. And uh, see you next week.